I had 10 qu questions prepared for you, so I'm but I'm going to go straight to question number seven. Prof, I, we, I've, I've sent you these questions and, and, and I think you, uh, in, in the context of what you've uh, said, I think you may uh, retort quite strongly in the instance of one. Uh, and I've separated them in, into about our country. Um, I think you always come across as being an eternal optimist. And I think in the context of everything else that's happening in South Africa, I think one of the questions uh, asked to us by the parents was how has your optis optimism changed in the last 10 years? Yeah, you know, as I said, I worry about whether Zara would be able to grow up in a society where she was judged by character. I wonder whether she was able to go to a good school uh, in South Africa. I, wonder, I worry that she'd be able to go to a university where people don't burn down on a Friday what they need on a Monday. It's the only country in the world that does something like that. Um, I, I uh, and so, and yet I'm optimistic, and the reason I'm optimistic is the following, and I've thought a lot about this, you know, we've actually been in similar situations, in fact, even worse situations before in our history. So if you, t you think like a historian and you take the long view, do you know that in 1899, there was a whole lot of people that thought that this was over, okay? And the two races at war with each other, they actually called themselves the races with the Boers and the Brits. <coughs> and they made a peace settlement in favor of the Boers in 1910, which of course created the Union of South Africa. Now they forgot they were also black people, but uh, you know. <laughs> um, they had the settlement and it was actually the first major reconciliation. Those of you who are old enough will remember that in 1989, there was about a dozen books written with the title like John Brewer's title, Can South Africa Survive? Five Minutes to Midnight. People thought this country, I thought, that my generation <laughs> would not uh, see Nelson Mandela. We really thought the Boers would go with their backs to the wall and just, you know, Craig Williamson said at the time, we haven't yet resorted to the football stadium solution. Holy crap. You know, I mean, that we thought it was over. And then Mandela comes out of prison uh, with his sort of wife. And um, <laughs> and we dream again. We've been here before. We have the incredible capacity <coughs> for forgiveness. Now, the only other country I know very well is the United States because I studied there for a long time. But do you know they don't have that philosophy? Their philosophy is if you hurt us, we'll hurt you. Okay? They still have states that, that, that poison people uh, for capital crimes or, or shoot them in Utah, or, and so on and so forth. So they have a very different, and, uh, and Martin Luther King Jr. used to warn them, you know, that um, if you live by this notion of, of the Old Testament of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you're gonna have a whole lot of people who are blind, <laughs> and you're gonna have people without teeth, <laughs> like <laughs> in the Western Cape. But okay, you didn't, say, <laughs> you didn't say the Western Cape, but you know what I mean, um, and so on. So. Um, in our country, whether it's Adrian Flock, whether it is the four boys at the University of the Free State, whether it is the killers of, or the people who attempted to kill Frank Chikane, we have this enormous capacity for forgiveness. Yeah, we're very macho, you know, our men walk around and they sort of think, but you know, at home his wife clubs him, you know, um, and she's in charge, but, but actually we have this capacity for forgiveness. This is the only country that has the enormous capacity to laugh at ourselves. Do you know who made the most money in the entertainment industry at the height of apartheid? A p chap called Peter Dergais. He would fill out the backs of the theater here, okay? And the, the culprits would be sitting there. They were so stupid, they didn't even realize they were the joke, <laughs> you know? What is our major export industry at the moment in cultural terms? Comedians. Comedians, Trevor Noah and the like. So we have this incredible capacity to laugh at ourselves. I mean, just imagine a guy comes up with this ingenious argument that instead of naming it the Cape Town Airport after Winnie Mandela or after Krotoa, imagine you name it Joe Masipas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry if you went to a Model C school, but you know, <laughs> that's a hell of a joke on the Cape Flats. You know? <laughs> I 
I sat next to a plane, on the plane the other day, next to a woman from Upper Wine, Upper Kettleworth, and she said to me, uh, prof I told her this joke, and she said, Professor, was Joe Masipas a comrade? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then, my other reason for hoping and for being optimistic, which is why I should show, is that we have a large moral underground in this country. You might not see them, I see them every single day. Because I'm in education, because I've got a big mouth, every day there's five, six, seven people who come to see me who are doing things that the government cannot do. The Irish in Meadow Ridge, Meadow Ridge is not too far from here. There's a couple, the Irish, they don't have a lot of money. They've transformed their house into a daycare center for children who do not go to good quality preschools, black kids mainly, and make sure that they then get to really good primary and high schools and onto university. I meet people like that every day. Math moms in Elsie's River. Have you ever thought of this ingenious idea of teaching working class mothers in one of the most dangerous territories, Elsie's, teaching them math so that when their children come home from school, they can teach them math. Two birds, one stone. There are so many people in our country that this moral underground that keep us together. And finally, the reason I'm optimistic is, um, you know, you've heard this land debate. I lived in the Free State and I was forced to go to something that was in my job description called Nampu. Have you ever heard of Nampu? Nampu is sort of an agricultural festival of farmers and so on in Puertavo in the Eastern Free State. Do, did you know something? That long before this debate started, I used to hear about farmers who not only shared their lands with tenants, third and fourth generation tenants, but shared equipment, shared training, and went with those black farmers uh, to raise capital. Because giving land away is easy. Making sure it's productive is a totally different story. I'm optimistic about our country because I think the majority of South Africans, forget Aaron's roots and his maniacs talking about a genocide against white farmers, it's total rubbish. And forget Julius Malema and, their, and that bunch of clowns who are trying to explain themselves out of a bank scandal. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of South Africans are decent. The majority of South Africans want this country to work. And that's the reason for my optimism. Great. Thank you, Prof. Um, the politicians often remind us that you serve at the pleasure of the president. Um, you have... <laughs> 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 You've... Uh, You've been, uh, if you were asked, and, and being a man of education, and if you were asked to, to serve as the minister at the pleasure of the president, uh, what would be a, a, a major change, or one single change that you'd make to, uh, to the education system? Well, first of all, my entire career, I've not served anybody. I'm not at the pleasure of anybody. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, they can fuck off. But... Um, <laughs> But I tell you what, I serve at the pleasure of our people. I serve at the pleasure of the poor. When I was in Google Air yesterday at Leitha Primary in the heat, working with young children, that, that's what I do. That's what I've always done. I, I serve at the pleasure of our people, not the pleasure of some puffed up politician uh, and, and so on. And I tell you the thing that I would do. I tell the minister, the, pr the president, your job is to keep Satu in check, okay? Because I only fight with the unions about what is obvious. Did you know they tried in the Eastern Cape the other day to block deaf kids from writing their first matric exam? In my book, that is immoral, that is wrong, that is something we must call out. I don't care, a union is there and should be there in a democracy to protect its teachers in this case, but not to disrupt the education of the children of the poor. Did you ever see a union coming here to disrupt uh, Herschel or Bosch? Or they don't, they go to where they, their kids are not attending and they disrupt those schools. So I'd say to the president, take care of that. The second thing I would do is just make sure, if you ask myself, well, of the 50 things you could do from pit latrines that must be fixed to, you know, what are your textbooks that must be delivered, what is the one thing that makes a difference in schools from all the research ever written on educational change? It's the quality of the teacher. Work on the quality of the teacher, make the teacher. And we did that in the free state, by the way. We said we're not going to do the stupid in-service training, which is a waste of money. We're going to put in every school. So the Premier came to me. I know he's in trouble now for the Pyrenees, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the Premier came to me with his MEC for Education, and they said, you know, we're from the ANC, and we just want to tell you something. I never forget that conversation. They said, we, we actually don't like you, but can you help us? I said, well, I don't like you either, 
but I'm going to help you. And I said, this is the way you change your schools. Forget Gray and forget Central and forget all these fancy schools in the Free State. Work with the bottom 20% and make sure that you put in the class of every teacher in, we just worked with high school, in physical science, mathematics, English and accountancy, you put the best teacher. So when the principal of Gray, Mr. Falski, had retired, I was in his office the next day saying, Johan, you have to me work. And I put him in schools to work with principal. And so on. Did you know that within two years, the Western Cape was so pissed off because they always had the top marks in, and it was the free state. Two years now in a row. And it's very simple why they did that. One, they have very few high schools, but <laughs> You work with the most disadvantaged schools. It can be done. The secret is work with the teachers. Did you know in one part of our school system, this is how unequal we are, the teachers know less mathematics than in another part of the, than the kids in another part of the school system. The reason we are struggling is because of the quality of the teachers. Not their fault, but it can be fixed. So I would put all the resources, and by the way, let me also say this, I wouldn't, sorry you guys, I love you very much, but I wouldn't put a cent into universities. I'd put the majority of the money into preschool education, because I tell you why. If you, if you can build the quality of preschools, remember we lose 500,000 children between grades one and grades 12, right? If you can just give the basic capacity to read and write, at that level, literacy, numeracy, you know. My children did well in grade one, you know why? Because in Durban they went to really good quality free schools, you know. And, and your child will do well, anybody say, if we can just get that right. Educational research is equivocal on everything. You can find debates on class size and student achievement everywhere, but you will never find a debate among educational researchers about the lifelong impact of good quality free school education on a young child. The benefits last over years. That's where we need to put the money. And, and if you just get preschool education right, and you work on the quality of the teachers, you turn around the ship uh, almost immediately. But no, I don't serve the pleasure of anyone <laughs> but the people. Uh, Prof, uh, we, we spoke, I think you've answered the next question. It says, how do we equip uh, in your chalk, and you dealt with it quite extensively, is we need to change the dynamic at home. Yeah. Uh, the question on, on racism, so I'm not going to do. I think this is, uh, it's something that Ruby uh, discussed uh, in, in, her, in her chat, uh, and I think it's, it's probably a, 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 a very, the most relevant issue at, at Herschel is, what are the most effective ways to make our children aware of their privilege? and have the, a true awareness and consideration for those less fortunate and to consider and take action to help those less fortunate from a position of mutual respect and equality. Okay, so the first thing that I think is really important, apart from what you do as a parent in the home, the other thing that you must, not, let me tell you what not to do, okay, this is very important. Don't make up when houses burn down in Kailicha make soup kitchens and all of that, drop it off and then you come back to Constantia. I think that is just not gonna help your kid, okay? You should do it for other reasons, but not. So if you want to really help your child, make sure that the people that first of all come in and through your home, okay? Um, let me give you an example of this, a personal example. So I'm very much aware of the fact that we are comfortably middle class, but I didn't grow up comfortably middle class. I grew up in Siena Retreat and I was, it was tough, it really was. But I'm very conscious of the fact that my children must meet their cousins in sea wind. They must work with them, go to the beach with them, they must sleep over with them and so on, and also with their friends and so on and so forth. So it's always being conscious of the fact that your child, to live normally, and, and again, one of the students here said, you know, something very important, the real world is very, very different, okay, from what you might have at Herschel or in your home. So the, the big exposure is to make sure that you not just drop off things, but, and I don't mean do things that these silly business people do, you know, we're going to sleep out in the township for one night a year. Oh, please grow up, you know. Um, make sure that the friends uh, that you have and, and make sure that the, the, the school children who attend here <coughs> also come from other classes. So let me put this to you the way I put it to Castaneda the other day uh, uh, in, in California. One of the things you can do because of your privilege 
is to be able to say we are going to more emphatically dedicate a portion of the resources of the school okay, to make sure that 20% of our children come from disadvantaged homes. You can do that when you're asleep. Okay? The question is, do you want to? And I'm not talking just about the kids who come from you know, South Peninsula or relatively good black schools. I'm talking about kids who, come who are really talented but come from really poor schools. That is, you're not just doing it for those children, you're doing it actually for altruistic reasons so that young children can also benefit from the mix of classes. Of I would like to see many more Jewish kids here. I'd like to see many more Muslim children here. In other words, give them a broad education. I make a distinction between schooling and education. I have no doubt that um, Herschel gives kids a really good schooling. I have no doubt about that. In fact, I'd be very suspicious if you didn't given your resources. But I'm not sure that you give kids a really good education because education is a broader term than physics and math. Okay? The Afrikaans people have a beautiful word, opfudding, raising up. Okay? And that requires that you learn with and from and amongst people, as I said, who don't look like you. So between the home and the school, between the church and the mosque, between we have a responsibility. That's the way you protect your child. Uh, but I, I think you've got a question about that that I want to speak to as well. Um, um, both, uh, both Steph and Ruby alluded to this point. Uh, and I think you, the, you, you've written a book about it with, with Dylan and Roy who were engaging with the school. This, this concept of belonging. Yeah. Uh, um, why is this concept of belonging so important to foster unity? And what should inclusivity truly mean in this context? Yeah, look, it's a basic human need. We have basic needs as human beings, and one of that is the need for acceptance, the need to feel that I'm not different uh, from you as a human being. And, and, and that emotion is so powerful um, that giving, and especially self-conscious adolescents, you know, giving them a sense, for example, in a high school, that we care at the school for children with disabilities. We care in the school for children, you know, who struggle financially. Making that a commitment gives that sense of belonging. But people bear resentments. You know, I, I, I have done probably about 100 odd interviews with one of my postdocs at the moment at UCT with students and, and faculty and staff. And one of the things that comes out very clearly if you look at these interviews is the resentments that students who went to good schools have about not having felt accepted. Yeah, they got a good education. Yeah, they got a, a good schooling and so on. So it is a basic human need to be satisfied that I've been embraced. Now, the word tolerance is a South African word, actually. It's the wrong word for what we're talking about. Tolerance in Afrikaans means vidra, you know? Oh, yeah, 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 we'll tolerate. No, 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 no. Think about embrace. Think about regarding the other person as your your own, as 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 your own uh, child, as your own uh, as your brother and sister. That sense of belonging is you know who understood that best. I don't think Ramaphosa understood it. I don't think Jacob Zuma cared. He was busy looting the state, and I don't think Tavo Mbeki he was prickly about it. But Mbeki and uh, Nelson Mandela understood that if he went to a godforsaken place called Orania, somewhere in the middle of nowhere between Strydenburg and Kimberley. And he'd land there and meet an unrehabilitated racist, Tani Betsy for Wirt, okay? And go there for the limited years he had left to eat milk tar for God's sake, you know? Um, he understood that that symbol, the symbolism, just like with the number six jersey at Ellis Park. Just like inviting the guy that tried to get him hanged, Percy Utah, the Jewish prosecutor. That the message of communion conveyed to those at a distance a sense of belonging. And so even a principal of a school, I'll give you an example of this. One of the schools I support very strongly in Marienburg, and they opened up now in Grassy Park. Do you know it's run mainly by Muslim friends of mine? 
But you know they would never ever start a meeting when I come there without asking a Christian kid to say a prayer, a Muslim kid to say a prayer, and whatever other religion there is. Do you know what that does to people in the audience? It's that sense of belonging. And the symbolism in a country like this, the gesture, really does make a difference in giving kids a sense of belonging. I think it was a Ruby that said, you know, yes. she but said it very quickly, um, but it was very powerful. You know what she said? I just long for the day I would be known by my name. I mean, to get me right there. Great, thank you. Uh, the concept of, of, of the school and, and versus diversity and values. Um, this again was, was a question we received. Should a school change its values to accommodate diversity or should those choosing to attend uh, the school adjust their values to accommodate, the di uh, to accom to accommodate diversity? How does the school balance its per perception of traditions with the requirement to be relevant and inclusive? struggled with that question because it didn't come from a good place. Of course the school must change. To Remember our schools were set up as black colored Indian African schools. For God's sake, if you think you can go 20 years into a democracy and say this is our school, you came here knowing it's a Christian school. Bullshit. That you won't find in the Gospels. That you won't find in the Gospels. In none of the teachings of Jesus do you see that kind of narrowness, uh, narrow-mindedness, okay? So part of being a Christian for me is to be generous, is to be open, is to be welcoming, is to sort of say, I don't lose my Christianity. In fact, I gain as a Christian, okay? When I begin to open my heart to those who believe uh, differently. So of course our schools have to change. They were created for a different purpose under a different era, and therefore we have to change. I don't put that responsibility on people who are coming in and feeling strange. I put that on us who are here, the residents, right? So all of our institutions struggle with the University of the Free State. I mean, it was a hard struggle to tell particularly white kids because they picked this up from their parents. This is not your university. This is a public university. My tax dollars, rands, goes to paying for you being here. So don't give me this crap that this is a white Afrikaans university. I want you here just like I want every other kid here for whom this place was not intended, okay? That doesn't mean that we deny the history of the place. That doesn't mean, that's why I fight to keep President Stain's statue there. I think I'll lose eventually. But, you know, he wasn't Rhodes. He was a man who fought for his people at that uh, time. Rather bring in the king of the Basutu, you know, and, and who was also was a peacemaker and put them in conversation, but this notion that I must, the only way to go forward is to get rid of things we don't like is like what the Taliban do. It's not what thinking people do, you know? And so, yes, the school has to change. And it doesn't mean you lose. It means you gain. If you, in, in this context, let me speak to Herschel, if your Christianity is generous. Thank you, Prof. Uh, the last question. Uh is in my opening address, I, I'd, I'd set out uh, our transformation journey that we've, we've embarked on as a school. What would your advice be, and based on the experience that you've experienced in your various schools, uh, as, a, as your parting, wo parting words of wisdom to us, what would you say we are the key areas we should focus on in terms of Look, where we're going? Yeah, what is commonplace in transformation, as you know, is dealing with the issue of who teaches the children. And you cannot go. Let me, and let me just, uh, okay, so who teaches the children? Who are the children you admit? What is the curriculum? And I don't mean the CAPS nonsense. I mean the broader curriculum to which you expose the kids. And, um, and the culture of the school. Those are the four things. Culture, curriculum, students, and teachers. Okay? If you can deal with that as a school without thinking that you're going to lose a lot, okay, I can tell you now you'll be ahead of the curve. Now let me be honest with you ladies and gentlemen, and I really love this school, I wouldn't have come here if I didn't. But if you don't do this, it will happen to you. I, my daughter was at Pretoria Girls. 
my daughter banned me from coming to school after I attended her first <coughs> school parents meeting like this. Woo! Sarah was angry with me. And I got up. She's great eight they had to sit on the floor. I don't know why Pretoria girls believe that you must sit on the floor, you know. So. <coughs> and I raised my hand and my daughter just went into it. And I said, please tell me, answer me two things. One is, why must my daughter knit? <laughs> I said, I bought her here because she wants to fly an Airbus 320 across the Atlantic. Why must she knit? <laughs> and the only reason she had to knit is because 100 years ago they knitted. <laughs> but for heaven's sake, you have machines that knit. <laughs> and I said, by the way, my boy next door, he's not knitting. <laughs> so I did make a gender point as well as a point of decision. They, I mean, the school banned me, you know, uh, from ever speaking there again. And, and then the air thing happened. I could have told you that air thing was going to happen. Because you have to change in relation to the fact that, first of all, it's a new year. Right? The kids should be coding and not knitting. Okay? But secondly, the fact that you had hair rules or length of skirt rules and this kind of crap in the 1920s doesn't mean you must have it in the 21st century. You with me? So I think part of what we do, Sansusi, I love the principal. I'm really sad that she left. She would, I, I, I really admire that. But you know, if you're gonna make a fuss about nonsense, I care, you know, then this is how you end up in trouble. So don't let other people, don't change under duress. Do the change during peacetime. And do the right thing. And the right thing. Thank you, Prof. Wait, Thank wait, wait, wait. There was a question that I must answer, which you skipped. <laughs> About and the quota. No, but you, you, you expressed disdain no, no, for the quota. No, so. no, no, no. The other question. And that question was clearly posed by a black parent. And you skipped. Discrimination. It. How do I prepare my daughter? How do I equip our daughters in high school, tertiary, and later life to deal with institutionalized racism, Absolutely. sexism, and marginalization? Good. How do we as parents help the change these dynamics? Okay. Now, this is a very important question. Okay. Um, and it affects all of you, whether it's sexism or whether it is uh, racism. Now, I do want to, there is something that's happening in our country that I've thought about a lot, and particularly at UCT, which is, um, besides the Free State, our premier researching on this thing. Okay. <laughs> And, and let me tell you something, what bothers me. What bothers me is not the discovery of racism. That's always been in, our, in all our institutions, not just universities, you know. And it's something that I struggled with. I couldn't get into UCT, not because I wasn't smart, but because I was black, it's a fact, you know. Um, I could get into any university in the world, but not in the university, it was literally a short train ride from where I lived, okay. And there's a lot, a lot of kids who went through that. Uh, etc. But what is different from students now, and particularly black students, is the sense of fragility. <coughs> the sense that when you face white authority or white racism, you fall apart. I don't get that. I was influenced by a man called Steve Biko, <laughs> and Steve Biko taught us that, as Neville Alexander interpreted him, he didn't say that black was right, he said that black was beautiful. And the best way in which you can protect your child against institutionalized racism or sexism is to give them a sense of themselves that makes them so powerful, so comfortable within their own skin that nothing around them disturbs their peace. And I want to give you an example of this. The first black woman anchor of PBS, a very prominent public television station in the United States, was a woman called Charlene Antigold. Charlene now lives with her husband in Johannesburg. I used to have my uh, I used to watch PBS just because at that stage it was like, for me as a young black student, amazing that you have this black woman on there. So when she came to South Africa, she told me a story once on the occasion of what they call Black History Month, and I was at Dickies as a dean. And she tells me, <laughs> just before she speaks, about her being one of six or seven black students, who were the first black students to be admitted to the University of Georgia which was then and probably still is a racist institution. 
And she says, as they came in, these black students in the 1960s, through the main gate of the University of Georgia, she says there was a welcoming committee <laughs> waiting for them. And these white people shouted at them, and at her in particular, who even said, nigger, go home, nigger, go home. And she says she looked around for the nigger. <laughs> <laughs> and the, m the, the beauty of that story was she was raised by a grandmother that gave her such pride in who she was that nothing could disturb her peace. What a powerful lesson for how to protect your own children. Because you, you, you won't be with them all the time. You won't see when your daughter's been put down by a bunch of men. You won't see that in this very misogynistic society. You won't see it when you're black. Uh, child is put down. What you can do is to give them a sense of confidence. And that means from the day they born, affirm, affirm, affirm them as human beings. Uh, we don't do a lot of that. You know, Americans are messed up. They, right, they're struggling now, as you know, the bomb scares, all of this. This is horrible. But you know the one thing they get right? Every American parent tells their kid the same did you know from the day they're born? I've seen that on both coasts. You know what they tell their kids? You are going to be the next American president. <laughs> now, it's not true. You must have at least one white parent. But <laughs> 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 affirm your kids, love them, tell them they're great. Um, and, and that's the best way to help them through great. difficult times. Thank you, Prof. That was the uh, uh, great parting words. Um, I'm going to call Zazie Khan up now to just do a quick thank you and parting word, uh, closing remarks from Stuart and, and Lynn. I don't know if I need your microphone, but you can have it. Okay, I'll take it. Sure, we, I feel like I've been to church tonight. <laughs> Amen. Uh, except for the, the swearing part. I don't think I've ever heard that in church before, but <laughs> um, wow, tonight was fantastic. Thank you so much. And I just want to, um, I've got some tokens of appreciation for our speakers. Um, firstly, to, to Ruby and to Stephanie, thank you for your courage and your bravery tonight and sharing your story. Um, I truly believe in the power of stories. Um, they can change people, and I believe it's one of the ways we're going to heal our beautiful country is by telling stories and actually actively listening to what people have to say and having a better, getting a better understanding of the people we share this country with. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, good luck with your studies and your future endeavors and continue to make a difference. Thank you. To the professor, I, I'm very, I feel very self-conscious about my slightly British twang tonight, <laughs> but I must, I must admit, I do live in lower gardens, so I'm hoping that <laughs> cancels it out. Um, but wow, you are a master storyteller. Um, you had us all transfixed, and there's nothing greater than a fantastic storyteller, and thank you for dealing with such tough issues in the way in which you did. I think it really did reach home. And I, I feel very optimistic standing here this evening because not just of the numbers that turned out, and I understand that Prof. Jansen is, a, is the draw card, but I'm hoping it's because we're ready to have these tough conversations. And I haven't been at Herschel long, but we do do a lot right. But there are things that, w that are challenges, um, namely genuine inclusivity. And it's something that we have to work on so that every child, every parent, every member of staff feels that they belong. Um, and I hope that that's what we're going to see. And, and, I f and I'm looking forward to organizing and uh, another evening. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you all there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.